Hello, my name is Joel Lehman, and I'll be talking about the surprising creativity of evolutionary reinforcement learning. I'm currently a research scientist at OpenAI, but this work was done when I was at Uber AI Labs. So the main sort of message of this research I'll be talking about is that it's difficult to design correct reward functions for reinforcement learning. And why, why does that matter? Um, well, if we want to apply reinforcement learning to really complicated tasks that could be of a very high value to society, um, then one of, of several obstacles that reinforcement learning faces is how do you specify the correct reward function? And this relates, um, if we look at this in the context of, say, like self-driving cars, just think about how, how many different factors going go into the reward function for successful driving. There's all the laws you have to abide by. There's the, the comfort of the passenger, not shaking the car too much, and so on. And, you know, it's really hard to actually codify that. And this relates to the, the growing field of AI safety as well. So it's really kind of intellectually interesting that a lot of the problems we consider as sort of core AI problems, like learning how to optimize and creating better reinforcement learning algorithms, um, even if we succeed on those fronts, it's still there's still some important core of the problem we might not have addressed, which is how do we actually specify um, the complex ends to which we might want to reliably direct these powerful AI systems. And so it's interesting that we still need to wrangle with that, even if we make the, the perfect RL algorithm itself. Okay, so onto the paper itself, which is about surprise and evolutionary reinforcement learning. So what is evolutionary reinforcement learning? Well, it's just one flavor of reinforcement learning algorithm where the the optimizer is an evolutionary algorithm. And it just so happened that this paper is, is on the topic, but the phenomenon that I'll be describing is, is more general than that. It applies to all sorts of reinforcement learning algorithms. Okay, so that's evolutionary reinforcement learning, but then what about surprise? Where can surprise c come from? So in some ways, it's a little, it's a little strange that um, if you have, are in complete control of every element of an algorithm, why would you be able? Why would you be surprised? And one way you can be surprised is that when we talk about reinforcement learning, your your reinforcement learning problem, there might be the 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 state space, the kinds of observations that an agent gets. There's the the action space, the kinds of affordances, the actions that an agent can take. And those are kind of straightforward in a sense. It's hard to get those wrong, but a reward function can be wrong. That is, you have an idea in your mind of what you want the agent to do, and the mathematical reward function you, you create, it's not necessarily the case that optimizing that reward function, that the optimum of the reward function you specify is the behavior you intuitively want. And this can lead to surprise. Now, there could be a good surprise where it, the agent finds a clever solution that you hadn't anticipated, but it's valid. And there could be kind of a bad surprise where the reward function that you um, create has like a loophole in it. You didn't, you just didn't specify it explicitly enough, completely enough, and there's like a, actually a loophole that uh, that the algorithm can um, exploit to hack the reward function. So, the paper I'm t I'll, I'll be talking about is, is sort of unconven unconventional in some ways because it's it's a collection of anecdotes, and this was necessary because it aims to highlight an important but a subjective element of our, of reinforcement learning, something that is sort of the, in the dark matter of um, science, something that is, it tends to be swept over in, in published papers. So the phenomenon I'm talking about here, where re reinforcement learning um, reward functions get hacked, it's well known to practitioners, but kind of sits outside academic research often, because papers tell the polished post hoc story and not the messy path there. You know, the paper will, will describe the beautiful reward function with all these terms that are well motivated and in the messy path there, which you did, the, the experimenter had to, through trial and error, try to, to figure out some reward function that the algorithm couldn't hack. So what we did is we um, crowdsourced this paper. So myself, Dusan Misevich, um, and Jeff Kloon, we organized a, a kind of a crowdsourced effort. Um, and we asked people to submit anecdotes from when evolutionary reinforcement learning had done something surprising. And what we ended up with is a huge list of authors because this phenomenon is quite widespread. And now we were able to kind of bring into the scientific publication, you know, some of this stuff that otherwise would, would sit beneath the surface. So to kind of give you an outline for the rest of the talk, 
what I'll do is highlight um, some examples of creativity and evolutionary reinforcement learning. Um, and then I'm going to connect that to reinforcement learning more generally. Um, just to highlight this, this isn't a phenomenon that's only in evolutionary reinforcement learning, although that's the subject of our paper. And finally, um, I want to connect this to promising methods for constructing better reward functions. So what actually should we do in the future? And I'll, I'll highlight some interesting research areas along uh, those lines. So I guess I'll go through the next section is to give a series of setups and punchlines. So the setup will describe kind of a reinforcement learning setup, and the punchline will kind of highlight the, the strange behavior that the experimenter didn't anticipate. And, okay, so this first one, uh, the first two actually, will involve something that's kind of common in evolutionary reinforcement learning setups. Like a common experimental paradigm is to try to evolve not only the, um, the control or, or neural network for a robot, but also to evolve the structure of the robot itself, the, the body of the robot. And in this first example, the idea is to evolve both the body and the brain of a robot for it to, to walk. And the reward function that the experimenter came up with was just measuring the distance traveled from the starting point. So you start the simulation, you see how far the robot gets from the starting point, and that's going to hopefully incentivize effective locomotion. And this was a research, I think, from the 90s, a long time ago. But what, what happened was a little bit surprising. Um, the robot learns to to somersault. Why, why walk when you can somersault? So it exploits potential energy. It d constructs a robot that will have all this um, potential energy and just you know leverages that to um, the, the locomotive. So the, you know, the, the fix to this hack is to not count the first couple seconds of the simulation. Let the potential en energy dissipate and then, um, then measure the reward. And that actually did result in um, successfully locomoting robots. Um, a second setup is similar, it actually basically happened 10 years later, and another experimenter basically recapitulated the same thing in a slightly different setting. So here, the, the experimenter is evolving both the structure and controller for a robot for it not to, to walk, but to jump. And the reward function is the maximum elevation of the center of mass. And that makes sense. Like you, you think that you know, just seeing how high the center of mass gets would be a good measure. And this is amenable to exactly the same pathology. So just re repeated a decade later by somebody else where you have this pole vaulting robot that you know, gets high but is not actually really you know, learning to jump very much. Um, Okay, so in a, in a different tack, we have um, a different setup where this experiment doesn't involve, uh, it only involves the, the neural network of a robot. And so let, let's imagine we have a six-legged robot, like this, this guy right here. And the setup is that we want to explore ways to make this robot resilient to damage. So we're going to incentivize it to walk in lots of different ways that rely on different subsets of its legs. And... It turned out that um, just one niche that um, was in this setup, just because of how it was programmed, is to walk using no legs, which seems kind of nonsensical. What would it mean to walk using no legs? Um, and what happened was that the robot learned to kind of quickly flip on its back and just walk on its elbows. So you know, kind of a creative solution to this problem. The experiments, experimenters did not expect to see this, but probably you wouldn't want to use this in practice because it could damage the robot. Um, but just showing, like, again, there's these weird um, edge cases that, you know, and, and a reinforced learning algorithm can learn to solve a problem in a very unexpected way. And another sort of um, pathology that's related to reward functions and that you might use a reward function to patch it is that oftentimes the... Um, Reinforced learning agents are, learning, are able to discover bugs in simulators, um, ways to break the simulator in order to make a reward go up in a very, you know, ultimately useless kind of way. And I'll just highlight two examples that um, happen in the in a, an Atari game called, uh, I think this is Qbert. And so evolution here discovered two different ways to break the simulator. So in this first, uh, basically it discovers an endless loop where somehow when it jumps this precise moment, it doesn't lose a life by doing this. And it just continues kind of um, getting killed by this spring over and over again and in an endless loop, which you know was not known at the time. And it also discovered a different bug, which is that some way how it's able to play the game in a way that um, 
So the objective here is to kind of cover all the squares, like turn them all yellow. And when it successfully at the end does this, it finds a way to stay in the victory state indefinitely, just collecting points. Um, so this video could go on for like 30 minutes. So it goes soon, there, now it's in the victory state and it just can somehow it, it's able to stay here indefinitely, just racking up points. And so, you know, to fix this, you'd have to, you know, modify the reward function or I mean, attempt to fix the Atari game, probably not that, that practical. So you probably would have to change the reward function to avoid hitting this bug. So beyond um, evolutionary algorithms, so all the examples I showed so far using just evolutionary reinforcement learning, um, uh, but you, this also happens in reinforcement learning that uses um, you know, policy gradients or value functions or whatever. And so it's not only about evolution. So this is an example from OpenAI, um, not research I was personally was involved in, um, but showing that if you have this video game and you're trying to maximize the score, you're trying to make this boat, in theory, kind of complete this race course, what um, the reinforcement algorithm, I think PPO in this case, was was able to discover is just this endless score increasing loop. It just turns around in a circle over and over again. And it turns out this actually achieves more points than if it were to succeed at the game at this level. And so it, it's found like a loophole um, where it can hack the reward function, um, but giving you a very you know degenerate behavior. There's another example that, that I think is kind of clever, which is this one from, um, from Twitter, where this researcher was hooking up a neural network to a Roomba to to help it to learn to navigate without bumping into things. And so the reward function that this person set up was to reward going quickly and to penalize hitting the bumper sensors. So the idea is like, you know, move, but don't hit obstacles. But what the, the, the robot learned to do was to drive backwards at quick speeds because there's no bump sensors on the back of the robot. So it, in some sense, it's obvious. Like this is kind of a pathology you might be able to anticipate, but maybe it's only obvious in hindsight after you actually see this, it's kind of like a gotcha moment. Because a human would understand the intent, but from a reward function, the you know the system can't really infer. It's very literal. It can't infer that your intent is actually to avoid obstacles more generally. So the, the lesson so far is that designing reward functions is difficult. Um, it requires a new way of thinking. It'd be a more adversarial, um, sort of incentive-aware, lawyer-proof, like looking for ways that, that the algorithm could undermine your intent. Um, and this happens a lot in evolutionary reinforcement learning. It also happens in reinforcement learning more generally. And basically, there's no, almost no way to avoid trial and error. Um, and so the, the obvious takeaway that you know, practitioners are, are really you know, from, uh, intimate with is you, know, you, you would deploy an RL algorithm with testing at first uh, because it's so hard to anticipate the incentives and what they will result in. Um, and so what I want to conclude with is just highlighting some promising ways that people are trying to tackle designing more robust reward functions. And this often involves reframing the reward function as an additional machine learning problem. So for example, there's something called inverse reinforcement learning. So standard reinforcement learning, you have rewards and environment and you learn how to maximize rewards. And inverse reinforcement learning, you take some demonstrations of, of someone interacting with an environment. You try to infer what reward they're trying to maximize. So you try to learn the reward function. It is you might learn that reward function and actually then be able to do better if you actually learn the general form of that reward function, then what the, the person who's demonstrating something was actually doing. And sort of kind of famously, this was used to um, learn acrobatic moves for a remote control uh, helicopter uh, that to, to perform it better, basically at, at you know human level caliber. It is something that's really difficult. This is kind of like a, one example called a, I think it's called a, a TikTok, um, some, some maneuver. So kind of an impressive result. Um, it, Another uh, kind of method along these lines is something called reinforcement learning through human feedback. And this is basically to treat a human um, as, uh, as a reward, reward function, to, to learn to model what sorts of things a human is preferring. And so in this, this case, um, this is, a, I think, joint work from OpenAI and DeepMind. Um, through human feedback, they were able to teach this simulated robot how to do a backflip. And in practice, it involves kind of learning to predict what the human will prefer. And so it's kind of a clever setup and, you know, it's maybe it's hard to think about how would you actually reward this backflip? It's not, you know, what, what terms could you construct, but actually you can just by giving people videos of, of behavior and progress, um, you can learn from that to learn a reward function. So these are, I think, promising directions that translate reward learning into, um, into a machine learning problem. So we, we all like machine learning. So this maybe is a great direction forward. So to conclude, um, AI is creative and it will find ways to exploit your objective function. 
Reward functions for complex tasks are, are hard to specify, and this is kind of an important thing that people are starting to realize, that there's commercial value in, in learning how to uh, learn and create more complex reward functions. And it's an interesting ML problem for the future. Like, what are the indirect ways that we can specify complex rewards? Um, and with that, I'm happy to take questions and I appreciate your time.